is for everybody. Fresh, pure, pure holy peace. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala sa'iri anbiya illah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. All praise is due to Allah, the sole creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. And may his peace and blessing be upon his last messenger and prophet, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon all prophets who preceded him, and upon the family of all of these prophets and those who followed their righteous guidance until the day of judgment. I greet you all with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you. In this program, we deal with the topic of peace and justice. We deal with peace because this is the first time that I am honored to speak and tape directly in the studios of the Peace TV. And the word peace means a lot to me, for peace to me is the core of Islam. But before we get any further, some might be wondering, why is the tie between peace and justice? I think peace and justice are like the two wings of the bird. You cannot fly with one. They are like the two sides of the same coin. Indeed, a lot of problems in the world today pertaining to the absence of true peace may be rooted actually in the lack of justice. It is through justice that peace can become more accessible and more prominent in our lives. But let me begin first with the notion of peace. You know, some critics of Islam say that Muslims keep saying peace, peace, peace. Islam is the religion of peace, but this doesn't explain, and they start talking about certain misunderstandings of the Qur'an or reference to behavior on the part of some Muslims, which is not in line with what normative or ideal Islam teaches. But we should never react to that by simply saying, all right, let's not talk about peace. On the contrary, we have to speak about peace, which I described earlier as the very core of Islam. The fact that some people do not abide by the requisites of that peace, it is their problem, it's not the problem of Islam. We should never be intimidated in not speaking about peace as the core of Islam. We can look at that on a number of levels. First of all, etymologically, that's the linguistic origin from which the word Islam came. It is actually in an Arabic root that is composed of three letters, but without vowel sign. That's how the roots are. Three letters without a vowel sign. In Arabic, it is seen, lam, mim. So the sound in English would be like S, L, M. And we call it root because these three letters appear in any derivative from that word, from that root. For example, if you put I in the beginning, and then put uh, A after the L, then it's Islam. The same if you use the word Muslim, that's a male Muslim, Muslima, a female Muslim, verb, noun, description, any adjective that come or derivative has to have these three letters. That's why we call it, it is foundational. But what does that all mean? It means that we can never fully understand a derivative from that root unless we understand the root meaning, because it is that root meaning that is reflected in all other derivatives. Now, this root, SLM, or Sin Lam Mim in Arabic, has related meanings, the most important of which are peace is one. It also has the meaning of submission, meaning submission to the Creator. Thirdly, purity. If we take the first two meanings uh, from which the word Islam came, it actually means that the whole of Islam or the core of Islam really is to attain peace 
through submission to the Creator to have the purity of faith and as such submit willingly to the will of the Creator of the universe. Now, the argument here is not just about the name Islam, which is quite significant in itself, that that's what Islam is, peace through submission, or peace through submission to the Creator. It is much deeper than that. In fact, when we speak about peace, we're not speaking in abstraction. We speak about important and different levels of, but interrelated levels, of course, of peace. One, that the foundation of pursuing peace would have to start with peace with God, Allah, the Creator. It is that peace with God that can result in another level of peace that is inner peace within ourselves. And if indeed we are true to our faith, that kind of peace with Allah, inner peace, would have to be manifest in peace with all the creation of Allah. Not only humans. Humans, yes, are the most important of the creatures of Allah. But peace with humans is only one part of it. Whether those humans are on the level of family, community, society, whether it deals with the relationship with people who share the faith of Islam or people who do not share it but share with us our common humanity, people of other faith communities. It also is peace or relationship of peace with the animal world. And we find in the teaching of Islam also how to live in peace also with the animal world. It is peace with the vegetation because that's part of the creation of Allah. It is also peace uh, with the inanimate object, with the resources that God has created in this universe, i.e., it is complete peace with the Creator, inner peace, and peace with all creations, humans, animals, vegetations, ecology. These are all under that. But how can that peace be achieved? The second meaning explains it. We can only as humans achieve that perfect peace or try to come as close as possible because we have shortcomings. To come as close as possible to that state of perfect peace only by having an authority that we all accept, the authority of our Creator. To submit, not by force, as Islam rejects any form of compulsion in religion, but if a person chooses willingly, lovingly, and trustingly to submit to the will of the Creator, that is the way from our viewpoints as Muslims. That's one level to start with. Where does the word or what does the word Islam really mean? But let's take it one step further. One step further. If we look throughout the Quran, the Holy Quran, the scripture of Muslims, if you look also at many of the saying of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we find that there are many terms, theological terms, there are many so-called eschatological terms, that's expressions or terms that refer to the end of the world and whether there is life after death or whatnot. Many of those key terms in Islam are also derived from the same root, SLM, that is peace through submission. How? Number one, one of the attributes, you can say names, but actually it's more of an attribute of Allah the creator of God, is As-Salam. We find that in Surah Al-Hashr, the 59th Surah of the Quran, that Allah calls himself As-Salam, which, of course, in the very literal sense means the peace, but of course it means that God or Allah is the source of all peace. That's one. Secondly, paradise, or the heavens, as some people would call it, something in the life to come, actually is called by the name of Darus Salam, which means the abode or home of peace, because that's the ultimate place when there is no more conflict, no more rancor or hatred. As the Quran describes, everything that's there is peace, 
everything that you hear is peace. And that's a very crucial term that is also derived from the same root. Thirdly, the Quran indicates that when people are entering paradise, the believers are entering into paradise, the greeting they receive from the Creator is a greeting of peace. As we find in Surah Yasin, the 36th Surah in the Quran, Salamun qawlan min Rabbin Rahim. Peace is a word, meaning a word of greeting from a merciful or compassionate God, Allah. Fifthly, the Quran also says that when people are entering into paradise, the angels will be there to greet them. And as the Quran describes it, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا صَبَرْتُمْ فَنِعْمَ عُقْبَ الدَّارِ The angels will be entering, meaning to the believers, from every door, meaning greeting them with the greeting, Peace be with you. We'll continue in a few minutes. Fresh, pure, 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 holy peace. We were talking before the break. A sixth point is that the Quran also say that when people greet each other in paradise, their greeting is the greeting of peace. The Quran puts it this way. تَحِيَّتُهُمْ فِيهَا سَلَامٌ Their mutual greeting among themselves is a greeting of peace. Now, in this sense then we can see that peace is not only just a, an abstract concept, it is not only inherent in the very term Islam, but in many of those theological terms. May we add to this that it is well known that there is only one greeting that is known and used by hundreds of millions of Muslims all over the world, irrespective of their linguistic background. In fact, that greeting became incorporated in the variety of languages spoken by Muslims. It is the key to the heart of a Muslim, whether you're coming from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, you name it, from America. Just tell a Muslim, Assalamu alaikum, meaning peace be with you, or the more complete one, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be with you. Regardless of background, they will know what you're talking about. It is the most common greeting in the world. And it's a greeting also that has good meaning. I tell my friends in, in uh, Europe and North America, I tell them, I have no problem if somebody says hi or hello, I don't know what it means. But there's one thing that I know for sure that it has a beautiful meaning. That mutual greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you. You know something? On my phone at home, I have a recorded message, of course, as many people would have. And the recorded message begins with, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of God be with you. And even if I'm home and able to pick the phone, the first thing I say, irrespective of who's speaking, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi, or Assalamu alaikum. And that arouses some interest and curiosity among people, especially those who are not Muslims. And many of them say, What? What, what did you say? I said, Assalamu alaikum, which means peace be with you, and that's the Muslim greeting. You know, many times I hear people say, Oh, that's nice. That's nice. This is natural, innate inclination among all human beings to pursue the peace. And when the greeting here is a greeting of peace, it really touches the heart, in my humble understanding, much more than hi and hello. It's really much more beautiful. And all of these are part of the argument, again, that peace is at the core of Islam. That's the second level. But you can take it also to a third level even. Just the term peace itself and its derivative. That if we examine what is called the supreme objectives of Sharia or Islamic law, even though the word Islamic law and Sharia may not be exactly equal, we're not getting into this details. But the five major objectives of Islam, you might say, supreme objectives, as derived by the scholars, 
from reading the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are five. Some say you could even add one to them like justice. But in that order, Islam is about safeguarding faith, which means again peace, that people are entitled to believe in what they want to believe in, to worship and practice what appeals to their hearts and mind. It doesn't matter whether they agree with you or not. They are entitled to that. They're entitled to equal protection for the right to believe and the right to worship the way they want. That could be a whole topic by itself, but I'm just stopping at that. Number one. Secondly, or the second supreme objective, is to safeguard life, the sanctity of human life. And that, again, is connected with peace because it means that a person is entitled to live in peace with others. And if you're not aggressing against others, you're entitled to have the tranquility and peace and to use your right to exist. The third is to safeguard the mind, both positively in a sense of encouraging reading, study, research, experimentation, and from the negative standpoint, by prohibition, for example, of intoxicants or anything that destroys or damage that beautiful gift of God. That, again, is connected with peace. How could I be at peace without it? Or how could I achieve that peace intellectually without it being free to research and to benefit myself and humanity at large? The fourth is to safeguard and protect the family, or in general, honor, honor of all people. In fact, this is also another implication of peace. It includes also, fifthly, to safeguard property, the right to own things and to use it in the legitimate way, acquiring wealth legitimately, disposing of it legitimately as well. So even the ultimate objectives, or supreme objective of Islam, are really connected very much with that notion of peace. With this in mind, let us now go back to the definition of Islam, beginning with peace with God, the Creator. Peace with God means to have close relationship with our Creator. A relationship that involves, first of all, confession of faith, willingly and convincingly, that God, the one God of all, not the God of Muslims, the God of all humanity, the God of the whole universe, is the sole creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. That's where it begins. It cannot be achieved without what we said earlier, by being willing to submit to God and to God alone, an unqualified submission. To have a relationship which combines elements of fear of God, and fear of God here doesn't mean like fearing from God or uh, because we, we might be afraid of tyrants, we might be afraid of death, but we don't like or appreciate or respect these things. No, no, that's different meaning of fear altogether. Actually, the most noble fear is the fear of disconnecting oneself from God, the fear of displeasing the Creator who created us and gave us all the blessings that we are enjoying in our lives. Yes, part of it, as the Qur'an indicates, the fear of punishment, but that's not the only one. Fear of punishment because Allah knows our psychology and our nature. And when a person is so much attracted to sin and transgression or hate or violence, sometimes remembrance that Allah is more powerful than we are and that He is able to punish us for our transgression against others, sometimes that also provides, at least for some people or for all people in different states of spirituality, a motive not to disobey God when we're attracted. One element of it, obviously, is to seek the reward of Allah, our Creator, that everything good that we do, righteous, we may get reward in this life in some form or the other, but definitely we get also reward in the life uh, to come. But that's not the whole thing. Because it, as uh, one of the great scholars described it, it becomes like a merchant kind of relationship that 
you know, I donate uh, that much uh, for charity now, but God will give me many folds. Uh, so they tend to think of the rate of return. But it's not just fear of the hellfire, which is there. It is not only hope for the reward of Allah, but above all, hope for the mercy and closeness of Allah. But the third element is very important, and the Quran does refer to that as well. It is very key in our understanding of our relationship with the Creator. A relationship that is based on the love of Allah, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran does refer to this. Describing the true believers, it says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ the believers, meaning true believers, are more intense in their love of Allah. They're not forbidden from loving others, but the greatest love that a believer has, the most intense love is that of the love of Allah, the Creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glory be to Him, He's so kind and merciful to us that He used a term in the Quran in a couple of places to describe Himself as wadud, wadud. Wadud is more than just loving. Actually, as Abdullah Yusuf Ali came close to the true meaning of Wadud, full of loving kindness. Full of loving kindness. But that love of Allah, or the mutuality of the love between the believer and the creator, is not a slogan. It's not just a nice feeling. It is certainly a nice feeling, no question. But it's not only that. It is a responsibility above that. As we read in the Quran, addressing Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to teach Muslims. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say to them, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if indeed you love Allah, follow me. Why follow him? Because he speaks for Allah. He receives the revelation from Allah. So we're not equating him with Allah by any means, but he speaks for Allah. He communicates to us the commands of Allah. Follow me, meaning follow the teaching of Allah revealed through me. يُحْبِبْكُمْ Allah. Allah will love you more and forgive your sins. These are essential ingredients in achieving that peace with Allah as the one and only creator, as the one who's not only worthy of being believed in as the creator, but the one also who is the only entity that we worship, that nobody else, no entity in general, is to be worshipped instead of Allah the Creator, or alongside to be equated with Allah, nor are we as Muslims permitted to pray to Allah through any of His creatures, no intermediary, even of the greatest of the prophets. We are not supposed to pray through him, we pray to God directly. This, I hope, might shed some light, at least on that level of peace, peace with the Creator. Peace in you, peace in me.